uh, down to the nitty gritty. I'd love to uh, extend a very special and warm welcome to again to Joe Buckskin from Arana Community Centre. Joe's worked with um, across adult education, health and community development uh, context, and her uh, lived experience as an Aboriginal woman. Um, has provided her with insight into the, the resilience and the vulnerabilities of Aboriginal peoples living in urban and rural contexts. Uh, jo is a strong believer in the reconciliation process and has firsthand experience in the planning and delivering and evaluation um, of the reconciliation action plan. So, uh, jo enjoys supporting and empowering non-Aboriginal peoples with cultural capabilities for working across diverse cultures as well. Uh, she's a huge supporter of ours and we're very happy to welcome her today with us to talk about uh, what Reconciliation Action Plan is and why it matters for your business. So welcome Jo and thanks for joining us. Thank you Carrick and good morning to all the early birds out there. Thank you so much for um, asking me to um, speak today <clears throat> and because it's NAIDOC week um, I'd love to share with you my experience in working with the Reconciliation Action Plans. So today I'm just going to address two um, key questions um, in this 15 minutes that I have. Some of you may already have worked with reconcilia Reconciliation Action Plans and might be right along up to an Elevate one. Um, so. What I'll do today is just look at what is a RAP and why develop a reconciliation action plan and what purpose it has for our local businesses. Um, then I'll give a particular, a couple of examples from a reflect RAP, um, just to give some concrete examples of what we could look at and work towards. And I'm very, very happy. I'm a local. I grew up in the Albury area. I am an actual Nunga woman from South Australia, but I grew up here. I have family here and um, I've worked in a lot of small businesses as a teenager and I've come back now as a community developer in the Springdale Heights region. So I'm local if anyone wants to follow up and have a um, conversation about it. So first of all, what is a reconciliation action plan? So it's a strategic tool and it sits alongside an action plan uh, or your, it aligns to your local um, strategic plan. And it, it's a document that supports practical actions that will drive your organisation's contribution to, to the reconciliation process started in around 2000 and actually um, is going to be an ongoing um, policy, proce policy directive and policy process in our country. Uh, reconciliation action plans include four types. You start off with a reflect wrap. You move on then to an innovate wrap. You then move through to a stretch and elevate wrap. So for example, if you've never had a reconciliation action plan, you'd start off with a reflect wrap. Places like local government or um, departments in across our state government, we're are probably looking at um, stretch or elevate wraps at this stage of the reconciliation process. But Today, we'll just have a look at what the REFLECT RAP framework um, encompasses. And the REFLECT RAP looks at things like relationships, respect, opportunities, and governance. A lot of you may be asking, you know, what is reconciliation? What is the fundamental question of that? And underlying recon the reconciliation process is uh, participation and in uh, observances like NAIDOC week. It's an ongoing relationship and it's two ways. It's nupaji nupaji. So it's a reciprocal relationship. It's informal, 
most reconciliation action plans really happen in our local communities over cup of teas or just meeting and having relationships uh, with First Nations people. But in a formal setting, a reconciliation action plan that is aligned to your local business um, has some strategic goals, targets and directions that help the reconciliation process. So what I'll do is move on to the next slide. And if we have a look at um, why we need reconciliation action plans, we might look at a spectrum of our skills, attitudes, knowledges and capabilities when working across cultures. And as First Nations people and as non-Aboriginal people, both of us, all people in our community sit along um, a spectrum of those knowledges and capabilities and skills. So for example, um, cultural destructiveness sits on the lower end of the spectrum. Cultural proficiency would be up at the higher end. And depending on where we're at in our experiences, we move along that um, cultural competence spectrum. And, it, and as we all know, with life experience, uh, with um, training and development, um, with young kids traveling after school, we move through um, and collect uh, different knowledges and skills and attitudes um, that help and develop our capacity to operate effectively um, in um, our workplaces, in our communities and in our families. Many of us have um, families who have, um, you know, a diverse cultural uh, <laughs> worldview. So I guess um, cultural destructiveness would be a, an example um, if we were going way back of apartheid. Um, stolen generation policies. Um, and, you know, part of our history is learning from policies and uh, legal frameworks and how we perhaps move on for, from there. An act of, if we're moving along that spectrum and looking at our cultural competence and cultural proficiency, examples would include um, local businesses who hire and make conscious choices to hire people from diverse backgrounds. It's about people, um, your local business seeking out and participating in um, informal conversations such as what we're doing today. So why develop a wrap? It's because we live in a very multicultural society and all of us as Australians um, should be celebrating this week because all of us um, have uh, can look back on 60,000 years of, of our country's history and what we're seeing now, I guess, with local fires is that the knowledges that um, some of our <coughs> firefighters have and we can use the different knowledges and skills of First Nations people and bring that into the 21st century um, and how we backburn and, and care for our country. And we can combine science and First Nations knowledges and work together and move forward. And, and to me, that's a reconciliation process and an, an example of how as a young country, we can move forward um, in a, within um, our within cultural proficiency, I guess. So let's have a look now at um, a reconciliation action plan. Just some specific examples, and what we'll have uh, after this presentation is Rachel will have a whole heap of links um, to how we can access this, these types of tools. So as I said earlier, um, a reconciliation action plan is produced by Reconciliation Australia, which is a peak body um, that has and develops and works with local organisations to develop um, 
your reconciliation action plan. So today we'll have a look at the reflect wrap and then <clears throat> innovate, stretch and elevate can also be um, covered in perhaps a different conversation. So an example of a reflect wrap in your organisation, and remember it's got to align to your local strategic business plan. So it's a similar framework. It has an action, a deliverable, a timeline, and a responsibility. And I've just given one example here, um, which I think highlights um, the, the types of actions and philosophy and purposes of what um, a reflect app, reflect um, wrap can define. So for example, under the um, heading relationships, a reflect wrap could just for example, establish and strengthen mutually beneficial relationships between First Nations people and local communities. Under the action, you'll have a number of deliverables, what the timeline is and who's responsible. So for example, I think if you've actually got a reflect wrap or you've probably seen one, they're very pretty documents full of um, beautiful artwork and uh, they really need, need to be led from the hierarchy up. So your CEOs and your management and that sort of team needs to be across these wraps without that drive, um, these reflect wraps don't infiltrate down through, um, through our local businesses. So they are and need to be um, actioned and delivered by leadership critical um, strategic direction. So if you move on, so that's relationships, there's four components in a reflect wrap. Um, the second component is respect. And, you know, as we all know, respect's an attitude and a feeling that's built over time. You know, we all have to earn respect. Um, and under this example, we build, we build respect with each other through our experiences and our relationships and understanding. So through developing our understanding of Aboriginal or First Nations histories, cultures and knowledges, um, we then develop more capacity, more awareness to understand and better um, contextualise our country's history and experiences. So um, as you can see, there's an action, some deliverables, a timeline and who's responsible. And as you can see in that responsibility um, column, it's leadership that really drives and um, gets behind some of these actions and deliverables. The next component of a reflect wrap is the opportunities. If you've looked at the literature and understand the research, um, what we know uh, really works is building opportunities to engage with, perhaps in this context, working in local business is increasing um, and building our um, understandings in, in, I guess, NAIDOC week. That's an opportunity that definitely um, Aubrey Business Connect took up with me. Um, and throughout NAIDOC week, Reconciliation Week, um, they're all observances throughout the year that we can all participate in as Australians. And as, as our little community here, you know, you'll go to schools and preschools um, and all of our um, local communities are celebrating in NAIDOC week and sharing histories, knowledges and stories around um, local history, um, statewide history, um, contemporary issues and um, sharing and learning. And that exchange is again, Napaji Napaji. And there are lots of opportunities throughout the year um, where we can have opportunities to sort of challenge 
some of the stereotypes that may exist around First Nations people and um, participate in um, increasing our awareness and understandings. Um, and the last, um, I guess, point in a reflect wrap is governance. Um, and here under action, we've got increased Aboriginal and Tor Torres Strait Islander supply diversity. So the state government and the Commonwealth government um, have a really good example of this where they procure now, um, it's mandatory to procure at least 3% of their business from a First Nations organisation to build the economic capacity and the entrepreneurship of Aboriginal businesses in this country. So um, Supply Nation, um, again, Rachel will send that link out, is a big peak body that has all First Nations businesses right from uh, right from bush tucker right through to design, architecture, whatever. Aboriginal people are across all those industries now, thankfully to um, really good policies that um, enabled us to um, access universities and come out as graduates and contribute to the um, to our society in a really positive positive way. So um, I myself was able to get through to university. I gained a PhD in um, cross-cultural education and, you know, have always used, you know, that Western knowledge and that Western knowledges and frameworks to empower, um, to empower myself, to empower my family and to give back to the community. And it's an absolute honour because I'm a First Nations person working in a little Springdale Heights community centre and I have great relationships and can give back and I'm role modelling and building relationships every day. So governance is particularly important and again, it is the last sort of uh, key to what a Reflect Wrap is. And then... Finally, if you go back to this slide, I'll just conclude that one. So the ref just to conclude now, the Reflect Wrap is a framework. It's a template that comes already um, made up. And then what you would do, I guess, is work with Reconciliation Australia and your local community um, to help populate that and what and identify what your local priorities are or could be in terms of that um, framework and tool. So does anyone have any questions? <laughs> and if anybody does have any questions, just feel free to pop yourself off mute um, and, and sing out. Just while we're waiting, if anybody does have any questions, Joe, I just wanted to say a huge thank you for the work that you're doing in this space to connect um, uh, business into <clears throat> a more cultural awareness, um, you know, to, I think there's, there's a lot to take out of this in the simplicity of it, which is really planning for action. Um, it's not hard. It, we confuse ourselves or overcomplicate things for ourselves um, very often. But what we're talking about here is uh, integrating some simple planning into hopefully a lot of businesses have already got a, um, a business case or an operational plan of some sort, and we're integrating it into that with, um, with simple uh, actionable plans. So I think the message in this is, you know, don't be scared to, to give it a go. Um, thank you for, for the work that you're doing in connecting the business community to this kind of uh, awareness. I think it's really important. The key takeaways for me that I found in that were um, it definitely, you know, all these peak bodies that um, that you um, mentioned that can we can connect to as businesses, such as the Supply Nations um, uh, service, which I think is just a, a great um, a great facility. But um, you know, knowing that Reconciliation Australia is out there as well to help aid in you know bringing these plans to life, I think, and people like yourself as well. So, did anybody have any questions? No? Thank you. Righto. Well, thank you so much, Joe. We really appreciate your time this morning. 
Uh, and if any, uh, Rachel will follow up with a, a post event email and send uh, all of Joe's details as well as her slide presentation and a bunch of useful links to you uh, this morning. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And thanks again, Joe. So now we're moving on to our second preventer, uh, presenter and uh, preventer uh, for this morning. We've got with us uh, Chris Cusack from NBN Co. Uh, Chris has more than 30 years experience in the telco industry and he's uh, held senior roles at Telstra, uh, Vision Stream, and most recently was the general manager of RSP uh, enablement in the business NBN team. Uh, at Telstra, Chris led the Hunter and the Central Coast countrywide team in New South Wales for over 10 years and led the Victoria and Tassie region for nine months. Uh, Chris deeply understands the importance of engaging and working with local communities to deliver the right solutions. He lives just north of Newcastle uh, in regional New South Wales. And uh, that's one of the great things about technology. We've got Chris beaming in from all the way up there. It's um, always great to have our uh, sponsors um, on Business Before Hours and with us at these, these sessions. Um, and we know that many of you are very keen to hear about the amazing work that MBN has been doing to improve the connectivity in Aubrey Wodonga, particularly around the, um, the MBN business fibre zones in uh, Aubrey Wodonga. So Chris, welcome to you and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Kerry. And uh, also thank you for the opportunity uh, to, uh, to present to, uh, to um, the Aubrey Wodonga business community um, this morning. And whilst I am coming to you from Nelson Bay this morning, uh, I do have uh, an affinity with the Riverina in particular, having spent six years in the early 2000s living in a, in a Chukamoama. On the, on the Murray. Um, I also might just uh, take the opportunity as well. Um, so in my new role, I head up um, um, NBN Local, which is our community engagement um, of our regional development and engagement business unit. And joining us today is someone that I'm sure that um, everyone on the call will know, um, is Andrew Cottrell, who has recently started as our community engagement manager for the Riverina and Murray and um, has uh, a, a long history in telecommunications um, and also uh, more recently with Business Australia as well. So I'm, I'm sure he's well known to all of you um, and we'll um, be engaging with you um, on um, around issue, initiatives such as what we're talking about today. Um, so I'm really pleased to, um, to talk to you today about our Business Fibre initiative. Um, if I could please get you to go to the second slide, please. So in, in September, we announced our corporate plan, um, which really is a, a roadmap of our, um, uh, our business over the, the next four years. And one of the key parts of that corporate plan was the Business Fibre Initiative, where we're creating 240 business fibre zones across Australia, um, including 85 um, of those zones in regional Australia, where depending on where those zones were located, um, there would be a discount of up to 67% of our um, flagship enterprise grade enterprise ethernet services where they would be priced at CB, uh, Metro CBD pricing. We also announced uh, uh, an investment fund to expand those zones further, which I'll talk to later uh, in the presentation. And importantly, um, even outside of the business zones, we've extended the ability to be able to offer um, zero dollar builds to our retailers uh, for dedicated fibre for these services for up to 90% of Australian businesses. Um, so we think this is a fantastic initiative to help accelerate um, and enable business growth, particularly in rural and regional Australia. If we can go forward to slide four, please. Next slide, thank you. Uh, and there's two key principles behind this. So firstly, obviously we've seen a lot of initiatives from both state and federal governments with, as we try and adapt um, to the impact that COVID has on society. And as we all know, uh, it's been particularly um, impactful to, to business. Um, so we see this as an opportunity and a way to help support businesses by leveling the playing field um, and enable them to adopt um, digital um, technologies um, that have been priced out of their um, prior, well, out of their reach in the past. And the second part to this as well is we've, we've seen over time businesses start to adopt um, collaboration tools um, and online um, tools, cloud-based tools, et cetera, 
um, over time. But what we have seen through um, the COVID pandemic is an acceleration of those take-ups. And we've also seen that in our network where we've seen a substantial increase in, in um, traffic on the network in, during business hours. And secondly, we've seen a substantial increase on what we call the uplink. So what people are transmitting into the network as opposed to what they're downloading, particularly in business hours. Um, we're seeing an increased take up in, in, in cloud-based applications. And I noted Carrick at the top of the, the meeting doing the introductions mentioned that leading edge data centers were on the call. And that's an example of an organization that's recognized that's growth and is actually investing in um, data centres across regional New South Wales. And we think um, this particular initiative actually aligns very well um, with um, what leading edge uh, data centres are doing and, and others um, operating in that space. If we could go through to the next slide, please. A, a key part to what we're doing here is these type of networks, these dedicated fibre um, services that are built for businesses generally have in the past reflected their bill costs, which ha ha has been at higher once you got out of uh, a capital city. So the traditional telecommunication market has actually priced these in a tiering or a zone based charging structure, which meant they were more expensive in regional Australia than what they were in, in the CBDs of capital cities. What we've essentially done with these business fibre zones, where, where we've been able to identify concentrations of businesses that are likely to take up these services, and we can make it uh, an economic case to be able to do it. Um, we've created these business fibre zones where all businesses in those locations will have access to our CBD um, pricing. Um, so the pricing that you'll get in Albury Redonga for these services at a wholesale level to our retailers is exactly the same if they were offering a buying a service from us in George Street in Sydney or Collins Street in Melbourne. And we believe that based on those 240 zones, um, there are 700,000 businesses that will be able to benefit from, from that pricing structure change. Next slide, please. I've just got a couple of slides and uh, just to highlight the, the, the coverage for these maps. So you can see um, that, that virtually the whole of the Albury and surrounding suburbs are covered by uh, the uh, business fibre zone. And then the next map that we've got on the following page also shows um, the quite extensive coverage as well across Wodonga. Now, individual businesses, and I encourage you to do so, you can actually go to the MDN business website, put in your address, and it will confirm whether you're in a business fibre zone uh, and eligible for one of these services. Um, and also these maps are available on um, the um, website as well. So you can see this is not just the CBDs of the um, of the uh, the two uh, Albury Wodonga. It, it's also covering extensive um, suburbs and also industrial precincts as well. If we can go to the next slide, please. So one of the things that we've also been conscious of as well is not only leveling the playing field from a from a CBD but, um, to to regional as well, but we're traditionally these services have been accessible for large businesses uh, and enterprise and government, we've been, worked very hard to be able to come to a, a wholesale price point to make these services accessible and attractive, uh, particularly to, to small and medium business. Uh, so um, not only have we flattened the pricing structure, we've also reduced it to make it um, uh, more accessible. So to give you an example, for 100 megabits per second, um, symmetrical, and these are symmetrical services, the wholesale price point is $230. Uh, and for one gigabit per second symmetrical, the wholesale price point uh, is $510. Uh, and depending on where you are located um, in Australia in these business zones, that could be up to 67% below the previous price. The other thing that we've done as well is we've also, traditionally the, the pricing has not been quite linear as your bandwidth increase, but it's been um, uh, there has been a, uh, an increase, a significant increase as your bandwidth requirements increase. What we've tried to do here, and you can see by those two price points I gave you, where for 10 times the bandwidth is only slightly more than double the cost, we've tried to flatten that um, price increase as well to almost encourage business to take higher bandwidth uh, uh, and or as their businesses grow and their needs grow and their usage demands grow, they can increase their bandwidth um, without having to face substantial increases in cost. If we can move to the next slide, please. 
A key part of what we've also done is we've recognised, so what we've been able to do is create where we've got an economic case to do so, these 240 zones and 85 regional areas. We wanted to particularly be able to, um, to work with local government and state governments to be able to expand business fibre zones. And this is particularly relevant to regional Australia. So where we haven't been able to create an economic case to do it in our own right, we will work with local government and state governments to be able to expand that. Uh, and that could also be an existing fibre zones where, um, where we've got growth or we can't quite economically cover an entire um, area. We can work to in, um, increase the boundaries of an existing fibre zone as well. So with $50 million that's been devoted at fund, uh, and we're actively working with state governments now um, and also some local governments on how we might um, leverage that. If we can go to the next slide, please. So I think what we've, uh, I spoke about the business fibre zones and the CBD pricing. What we've also um, been quite, quite conscious and, and really trying to drive as well is how we can support business across Australia. So even if you are outside of a business zone, what we've been able to do um, is we've been able to cover 90% of Australian businesses where if you um, sign up for an enterprise Ethernet service on a three-year term with one of the 23 retailers that are in market with that product, um, you'll get access to a $0 bill. So we won't charge the retailer to build a dedicated fibre to your business. Um, we can't, uh, the, the retail price will be set by the retailer, but we will not charge um, for, for that fibre build. So that's also a fantastic um, um, step change, particularly in regional Australia, uh, where we haven't been able to offer that before. We can go to the next slide, please. So we've just got a couple of, uh, some example um, cases here where this type of service will be particularly attractive. So if we look at the medical imaging in particular, the med medical practice, the medical imaging is a good example of this, where they have high requirements, very large imaging files that need to be trans um, you know, shipped to potentially hospitals or other practices, et cetera, um, or to patients. These services actually provide a um, higher bandwidth, higher reliability, higher availability to enable them to be able to facilitate those. We know that in manufacturing is increasingly moving um, to a digital world uh, and more often than not, whether they're engaging with suppliers and partners, they need to do so and collaborate with them digitally um, with CAD files, et cetera. So um, the, these type of services will enable them and even quite small businesses, they could be involved in graphic design, et cetera, where they've got sophisticated data needs they're now able to access these services at a price point uh, that they're going to be able to uh, afford um, um, to be able to um, leverage these, these um, enterprise Ethernet services. If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, and um, next slide. And next, please. And next. So I just wanted to find, uh, touch on uh, Enterprise Ethernet, which is really the service that you, you um, take up in these business fibre zones. It is our flagship business grade product. It is a dedicated fibre service to your uh, premises. We build it on demand. So when you raise an order, we build a dedicated fibre to your business. It is different to our fibre fiber to the premise network. It's got a higher level of reliability. As you can see, it's 99.95% .95 available. It has some, and supports symmetrical speeds. So that is the, what the uplink and the downlink speeds are uh, equal. Um, and, and it starts at 10 megabits per second and goes up to nearly one gigabits per second symmetrical. Um, and it's also supported by our Melbourne-based um, operation center, our business operation center um, that's operated 24 hours um, a day, seven days a week. Um, and I think that's the final slide. I just wanted to, I've gone through that quickly because uh, I just wanted to enable um, some time for some questions. Thanks, Chris. <coughs> Excuse me while my voice carks it on me. Um, I guess while we're waiting for any questions, if anybody does have any questions, just feel free to unmute yourselves and, um, and fire away at Chris. But um, I guess the key takeaways for us uh, when we look at this opportunity is it's, it's not going to be... Uh, something for every business, but 
it is a real game changer, I think, for, uh, for the business community here. I think it's really going to uh, mature Albury Wodonga's offering as a regional business investment destination. It's going to mean that, um, you know, we're going to get a lot of interest from the metro areas in, um, in bringing their businesses to uh, regional Australia, which I think is a great thing. It's a catalyst for investment, especially at the moment um, with all the decentralisation that, you know, the timing probably couldn't have been better with COVID um, happening for a regional area like Albury Wodonga. Um, yeah, I think uh, if there's any other questions, I'm, I see we do have a couple of, um, of businesses in the IT area. If they've got any questions or comments, um, be interested to hear what it actually means for, say, someone like you, Gav, at Lightning IP. Um, you know, how is this going to uh, enable you guys as a as a business to to grow? You know, your business, not just um, you know through being able to sell something, but um, through empowering your clients so that they can do more. Gav, have you got anything to say on that, mate? Yeah, so um, obviously at the moment it's been a fairly new product to market or the, the initiative of the Business Fibre Zone from NBN. Um, we have definitely seen some interest in the product, um, especially from larger businesses. And I think the, the what most people probably don't understand is how much, uh, I guess, how, how a dedicated Fiber service is actually different from the standard NBN offering. Um, it is really dedicated just for your business, so you do have that that guarantee of a service. So if you need it, and especially the upload speeds, I think heading forward, Chris mentioned it. Uploads are becoming such a large part of what we do, uh, connecting with cloud services these days. That it's just going to be vital, especially if you if you have 10, 20 people in the office you're going to notice it very quickly, having a much faster upload speed available to you. Yeah, thanks, Gav. And I guess um, just to speak to uh, one of Chris's last slides, um, identifying that manufacturing, um, medical and advertising, just as a couple of industries, are, um, you know, as some of the data, uh, heavy data users, um, you know, for a, a region like Albury Wodonga, which does have strong manufacturing and strong manufacturing potential, um, and also the medical industry being um, so prominent here as well. Um, advertising, I think, you know, it's something that every business is, is having to do more. So we are all consuming more data um, and we are uh, all upscaling our businesses. This will, I think, you know, un like Gab said, understanding the difference between these dedicated lines um, to the standard, um, you know, NBN services that most of us use at the moment is going to be a critical thing. So I would encourage... Uh, all of our members and listeners and viewers out there to do a bit more research on this, get in touch with um, with your local service providers and uh, Andrew Cottrell at NBN Co as well uh, on the ground here in Albury, Wodonga. Learn more about this infrastructure and how it will um, enable and empower your business because there's there's some pretty serious opportunities here, especially considering the, um, yeah, the, the cost of it. Um, so if there's no other questions... Yeah, Tarek. Tarek. Oh, sorry. From, uh, I've got Phil Clements. I've got you putting your hand up. Yeah, look, Tarek, just a quick one. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, uh, just wondering at what sort of uh, point this, <coughs> pardon me, cuts in. Like, is it, uh, I can see the advantages with the bigger businesses that you talked about, uh, the people with one, two or three people in their offices, the anything on that sort of zone that this will apply to at this stage, or is that a bit further down the track? I think that, that, that if you've got a small bit, so we've got a, a multi-technology mix network, it works well. Um, and it works for small businesses really well uh, at a really affordable price point. But depend, even a very small businesses, if you have sophisticated data needs, so I'll give you an example where one of our early adopters, believe it or not, in Tasmania was a tyre retailer. Uh, and they are, but they deal nationally there are specialists with particular tires and they wanted to have a sophisticated website to be able to deal with their customers and all that or also to be able to um, um, have um, uh, improved networking with uh, their suppliers so even that as a small business um, have adopted these type of services so i think at the price we're seeing retailers coming to to, to market um, you know sub 500 dollars a month um, uh, so uh, they are at a price point that small businesses can afford. 
Um, it, it are, there are particular businesses that this is type of is attractive to, and we gave some examples there for small businesses that um, that don't need sophisticated data requirements. Then our um, our, our uh, multi technology mix network um, will, may, may meet their needs. This is really as your needs grow, uh, or you've got specific intensive data needs, or you want to move into the cloud and and really accelerate digitization. You've now got a price, a cost-effective way to be able to do that on a dedicated fibre, uh, where you're going to get um, high performance, high speeds, high guarantee. Thanks. And I think we had somebody else uh, with a question as well. I remember, or was it Andrew? And you uh, wanted to Jared, it, was, it was me. I just just wanted to add a comment that uh, for anyone needing a bit more information, obviously Chris spoke about those links on the uh, the website, the Business Fibre website, but uh, we'll actually be holding a, a launch event for Business Fibre for Aubrey and Wodonga on the 3rd of December. So uh, if anyone needs to, to hear more about that, particularly the RSPs need any more information, but also any businesses that may be interested, um, set aside that morning for December the 3rd for our, uh, our launch event at the Mantra in Aubrey. Yeah, great. Thanks, Andrew. And we'll make sure that we circulate that to the members. Um, is there any other questions before we start wrapping up this morning? No? Great. Chris, thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, and Andrew as well. We really appreciate the time that you've taken to share with us this morning. We, um, you know, we may only have uh, 30 or so on, on with us this morning, but we're getting a lot higher views um, uh, with the um, uh, through our YouTube channel, so um, I'm sure your message will get out there a lot more. Um, just to wrap up quickly, some some final announcements uh, just regarding uh, the last couple of events for uh, to see us out through to the end of the year. On the 30th of November, Project Management in Action uh, will be having an event on portfolio management during COVID-19, which is uh, is definitely still a hot topic on how we actually handle ourselves in a, in a pandemic. Uh, on the 30th of November as well, um, the project management in action crew will also be just having a um, Christmas social at Atura Albury. So uh, if you're interested in, in socialising and networking with some of the, the project management crew, please get along to that. Um, all of the event details are on the website. Um, a final, just a quick reminder to please, please, please participate in the membership satisfaction survey. If we don't hear from you, um, we won't do what you want us to do uh, in 2021. It's as simple as that. Uh, we want to know uh, what topics are important to you. We want to know how we fared as a service provider for you, uh, what your experience was like, and uh, if there's things that we need to sharpen up or get rid of, or introduce, all of that comes back to you guys participating in that survey for us. So um, we would really, really appreciate that. Um, I guess, you know, <laughs> scarily enough, Christmas is just around the corner. So this is our final uh, business before hours for the year. So I would really like to say thank you to everybody for staying so engaged through some really challenging times through COVID-19 uh, and the bushfires this year it has not been easy uh, but we i think have have really proved that um, by sticking together and sharing knowledge uh, and communicating with each other that we give ourselves a much better chance of overcoming these challenges so um, thank you so much for staying engaged thank you for a great year although it was a challenging year um, we look forward to a, a very productive 2021 uh, hopefully with no surprises uh, and uh, I wish all of you the, the very best for your Christmases, wherever you manage to get to. Please stay safe, uh, look after your families, stay COVID safe, and we will see you all again in early 2021. So thank you and have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Garrick.